Okay, welcome everybody to this uh, new seminar of the Advanced Computing and Machine Learning Thematic Area. Thank you for coming today. Uh, I'm very happy to have uh, Esteban Ferrer um, joining to, to give us a, a seminar about his latest research. Uh, I'm going to go through his uh, biography first. So Esteban Ferrer is a professor in applied mathematics in the School of Aeronautics at uh, UPM in Spain, in Madrid. Uh, he obtained his PhD uh, by the University of Oxford in the UK and has uh, 20 years of industrial and academic experience in developing numerical techniques for fluid problems. He works actively with industry and coordinates the ITM project Asimia. He has written 81 journal and conference papers, has received more than 1,360 citations, and his main interests include high order methods for fluid dynamics, turbulence modeling, stability analysis, aeroacoustics, optimization, and flow control for aeronautics and wind energy. So thank you very much, Esteban, uh, for coming today. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Ricardo, for the invitation. <clears throat> right, so today I'm thinking of presenting um, the newest developments that we have in our own in-house uh, solver, which is called Horses 3D. And I will show you well, a, few, a few new ideas that we have implemented. So I would like to thank, of course, my collaborators, particularly Ricardo for inviting me, my collaborators at UPM and uh, some external collaborators, and especially the students who have done most of the work and also the funding bodies that have helped uh, perform these, these simulations and this research. So um, in our group, we develop numerical methods for incompressible, compressible solvers. And I will be talking about this part in particular today. Uh, in particular, we focus on these continuous gravity techniques, we also do flow control uh, based on stability sensitivity analysis, but I'm not going to be talking about that today. And we apply all these types of techniques to aeronautical applications, wind and tidal turbines, multi-phase flows, etc. Right, so the, the outline for the talk today is I'm going to give a brief introduction to higher the methods, and in particular, this continuous galerking. And then I'm going to be talking about the multi-physics we have included in our uh, solver, higher the solver, which is called Horses 3D. In particular, we'll be talking about moving meshes, multi-phase turbulence, or acoustics, and then some new developments that we are quite excited about, which are uh, including machine learning to accelerate um, or to do alternative things with machine learning in the context of CFD. So I'll start with a brief introduction. Uh, so higher the methods, in lower the methods, we typically have a, a mesh made of triangles, uh, and we have a either a constant polynomial or a linear polynomial inside each element to capture the solution. In higher methods, we relax this constraint and we can have polynomial, quadratic polynomials, cubic polynomials uh, to capture to better capture the solution inside each of the elements. That allows us to, to, to do two things. One, we can increase the number of triangles fixing the polynomial to get a better solution. Or alternatively, we can fix the number of triangles and increase the polynomial in each element. And both have different, different error characteristics. So if we check that for a Poisson equation, for example, and we check the relative error in the y-axis against the degrees of freedom on the x-axis that include both the number of elements and the polynomial. Uh, and we run simulations uh, with different polynomial orders and in different meshes. What we observe is that if we fix the polynomial to two here in these lines, and we only vary the number of triangles, right? These are the different colors what we observe is a, a slow decay of the error. That, that's what we call H refinement. It's increasing the number of triangles, fixing the polynomial. However, if we fix a very coarse mesh, this is, this is the, the red curve here, very coarse mesh, and we increase the, the polynomial order in its simulation, what we observe is a very rapid decay of the error. What this uh, means is that if we want to achieve a particular level of accuracy, for example, here 10 to the minus seven, we need fewer degrees of freedom with a high polynomial order on a coarse mesh than using a low polynomial on a fine mesh, where we will need many, many more degrees of freedom. We are outside the graph, in fact. Um, so in reality, this translates into this kind of behavior. So if we compare a higher order method with polynomial order five uh, against a lower order method, a commercial code fluent, and in a very coarse mesh for the higher method, quite fine for the, for the finite volume. What we observe is that the structures are uh, soon uh, disappearing from the flow because of numerical errors in the lower the schemes, whilst in the higher the methods, we, we keep them for a very long time. 
meaning that the errors in the solution are much lower. And in fact, we get uh, better solutions for longer term. If we go to turbulent uh, problems, we also observe uh, advantages of higher order methods. So in the middle, we have a DNS simulation. Um, on the right, we have a low order and steady run simulation with a low order method. And we see that more or less we capture the, the shape of the, of the detached flow that we have here. But of course, we lose all the dynamics, all the small structures inside the, this detached region. In particular, the Kevin Halsman's instabilities here are completely lost. Uh, however, in higher order methods, on a very coarse mesh, you can see here the triangles, which are very coarse on a polynomial of the five. What we see is that we don't capture everything. Of course, the mesh is super coarse. Uh, and it's a, a, a very coarse LES computation, but we do capture much more structures that we were capturing with a low order method. So we have this higher order method pretty well developed. We can do many, many things uh, these days, and I will show you the, the newest things that we can do. So today we're focusing on the Horses 3D, which is our uh, our how uh, in-house uh, method. It is available on request. So if you're interested in using it, just let me know and we, we will give you a, a, the possibility of using it, of course. Uh, the idea is to make it efficient. So we're using some uh, excedral elements to make things efficient. I will show you a little bit how. The, the things we have included now in our solver are compressible and compressible solvers. We have entropy energy conserving schemes for stability. Uh, we do local pre-adaption. Pre we can do explicit, implicit in time. We have a variety of turbulence models ranging from RANs to LES. Um, and then we have some multi-physics, so we can uh, solve multi-phase flows, immense boundaries, and, and some other things. I will show you some, some of these things in, in detail. Um, again, this is the website. And then we are now preparing a, a paper, which includes all the latest developments uh, that I've been explained. So we can do runs, we can compare with uh, other, other solvers, finite volume solvers, and we can run aircrafts such as this one. We'll show you some details later. What's interesting perhaps is that because we have this high order possibility of using high polynomial orders, when we combine uh, MPI with OpenMP, we get very good scaling properties, especially at high order. So we reach almost ideal scaling speed ups for high, high, high polynomial levels. And this is due to the locality of the degrees of freedom inside each other. Um, we have run some, some more cases with different wings. Um, and what we observe uh, due to the efficiency of our implementation and also due to the parallelization strategy, what we see is that when we run uh, different, different, so different wings, so this is one wing, this is a different uh, wing with a different edge mesh, this is a different one and the points correspond to polynomial orders, what we see is a linear increase in the polynomial in the cost with when we increase the polynomial. Order. So this is P2, P3, P4, P5. Um, so remember that the, the decrease in error is exponential, but the cost increase, it's only linear. So that tell us that it's very advantageous to use higher order polynomials with our, with our solver. Um, so, to finalize, this was in fact, we were looking at the acoustics of these, of these wings, the ones that I just showed you. And we are seeing that we can, if we monitor the sun pressure levels at some particular points, for example, like this one, what we get is a polynomial um, and exponential decrease of the error. So we get P convergence as we get to higher polynomial orders, right? Whilst the cost is still only linear. Right, so this is about a little bit about the solver. Now I'm gonna show you some specifics of the multi-physics. Right, so in the past, we have worked uh, a lot with uh, sliding meshes. So uh, sliding meshes allows you to, to rotate some part of the domain, for example, whilst the other part is, is steady. We get, we get hanging nodes, and it's a method that it can be easily handled with uh, discontinuous galeric methods because we have these continuities in between the interfaces. However, it's a bit costly as a method, right? Because you have to interpolate, you have to compute uh, interfaces, but well, it's not, not the cheapest. So these days we are uh, focusing a bit more on immersed boundaries, which allows us to do similar stuff. So immersed boundaries is a, a mesh-free method. Mesh-free meaning we only need a Cartesian mesh. Uh, so typically we use Cartesian meshes that don't have to be body fitted, so you don't need to mesh much. Um, 
and then we do some local peer refinement in some particular regions of the domain. What we the, the method works uh, like we, we define a, an interface, we define a, a, a CAD model, right, with an STL uh, CAD, and this is seen by the solver, and the solver adds some source terms that represent the body inside the mesh. So we don't need to represent the body uh, explicitly in the mesh. It's just an STL file that we import, and then the solver will include some, some forcing in these in this parts. By doing so, we can uh, easily, without needing to mesh uh, almost anything, uh, we can do complex geometries and we can do uh, moving geometries quite easily. Right, so remember there's no meshing involved or not costly meshing involved, and this is the main advantage of this method. Right, so with this uh, setup, what we can do is uh, run cases of moving NACAS, for example. Here you have a couple of examples. You have the specifics in these two papers at the bottom. If you wanna see the, the proper results. Uh, we can do pinching and plunging as well. And we see that we get very good agreement with the reference values. So one of the things that are typically criticized for this immersed boundary method, it's the accuracy, uh, it's typically lost. So why use higher the method if you're gonna lose the accuracy uh, near the walls and things like that. Right, so for this, we have checked that increasing the polynomial, increasing the polynomial order, we, we do get uh, exponential convergence. We get much better results, much more accurate results when we increase the polynomial order, right? So we are not losing the, the nice properties of higher the methods when we use these immersed boundary uh, uh, methods. Right, so I'll show you one last case. So this is a, uh, the immersed boundary method with for a wind turbine, which is gonna be rotating, uh, well, the rotor is gonna be rotating, right? So to, to do the setup, we only need the CAD file, an STL file, right? We need a simple Cartesian grid that can be homogeneous or can be a bit refined in a certain places if you want, but, but it, you don't need body fitted. So it's only an easy to make mesh, right? And the solver is gonna add some points where the, the this is already in the mesh, right? So the, it's gonna select some points where it has to penalize, where it has to add some source terms to uh, mimic the effect of the, of the wind turbine. Uh, so if we have a look, what we see is this kind of mesh. So here you can see the whole mesh. We have refined a little bit in this region, uh, but it's kind of Cartesian. So it's mesh all, all, all throughout the turbine, right? But we will get some flow field uh, inside. In this particular case, we have increased the polynomial order to P3 here, and we have left it to P2 outside to get better to better capture the rotor and, and the wake. Uh, but this again, is very easy to do. And then if I overlap on top of the solution, the STL file, I can see the effect of the blade are in fact, so the STL is really not there. So it's just, uh, this, this one is the profit really, right? But if I overlap it, we can see really the effect of the tip vortices, tip vortices and everything is well captured, right? So this final, finally you get this solution. Uh, when we can overlap the STL, but in fact, it's not necessary. It's not really there. So, okay, I hope that, um, right. So now we have a variety of ways in our solver to uh, compute rotating turbines, fans and propellers, right? In particular, we have in the past, we use actuator disk. We have now a couple of different implementations for actuator lines, which do not resolve the blades. It just add forces for the blades, but the, you can get the effect of rotation as well. Oh, yes. Um, sí, espera, momento, ahora. Miguel, moteate, papá. Miguel, moteate. Eh, ¿Me escuchas, Alex? Miguel, por favor, moteate. Sí, ahora mejor. Please, if everybody can mute themselves. Vale. Right. Um, right, so the actuator line, we have also the immersed boundaries. We have just seen that. And we have in the past used sliding meshes. In the near future, we would like to compare all of these and try to correct the low cost uh, models, so those ones here, with the information we get from high, high um, costly models. That's, that's the future. But regarding multi-phase, what, what we do is we use phase field models. So phase field models uh, uh, capture a uh, diffuse interface, such as this one, for the water and air, for example, through the Canhillier equation. Uh, so we solve navier stokes plus an additional Canhillier equation to uh, get the effect of the, of the multiphase. 
With this, we can uh, run different different test cases, typical test cases. We have a, a few uh, a few papers on that. And one of the latest things we have done is we have uh, allowed for peer refinement across the interface. So we increase the polynomial order only at the interface, and that allows us to have a speed of speed uh, much quicker solutions for of fifty percent or less. Um, one of the key points in this in, in our formulation for multiphase is that we use uh, entropy stable methods. So these are much more robust than classic methods. And I'll tell you only the main idea of this. So the continuous equations, uh, we typically solve the Navier-Stokes equation. We do exactly the same. We solve the, 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 the Navier-Stokes equation. But if you think of the continuous equations, this also, uh, it's easy to check that they conserve kinetic energy or entropy, right? Uh, this is in the continuous setting. Now, typically when you discretize these equations, you don't check if these new equations satisfy kinetic energy uh, conservation or entropy conservation. So what we do in the entropy energy stable setup is we check that the discrete version of the Navier-Stokes equation also fulfill these additional equations, like energy equation. Since we have a, 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 an equation for energy, a conservation equation for energy, we ensure that uh, the energy cannot blow up, cannot increase infinitely because it's conserved. Right, so there's a few techniques to do so in higher order methods. I'm not boring you with the details, but we, we know how to do it. And we have developed these things for, for multiphase. Right, so if we see the, the what, what we observe typically is that if the interface is very smooth, so everything is very well resolved, such as in this case, both the standard DG and the energy conserving DG, they both con converge quite, ni quite nicely. Now, if we get on the resolved interfaces, so we start getting oscillations and we start getting perhaps not enough uh, resolution, DNS type resolution at the interface, what we see is that typically the non uh, energy conserving blows up eventually, whilst the energy conserving keeps going and gives a, a, a good solution. And we can see that for different regimes with different interfaces, but this is the typical trend. Um, right, so that was for multiphase. By the way, we use these energy stable schemes also for turbulence because we have this problem of on the resolution and we get more robust uh, methods. Right, for, let us talk a little bit about turbulence. Um, so in turbulence, we have now developed a higher order runs. So that is palatamas negative. And this is the slide I showed you at the beginning where we're comparing with uh, a, a well-known Numeca CFD code. Uh, that's made by Numeca company, right? And we see similar flow fields. And when we compare the convergence, again, if we use higher the methods, we see much quicker convergence towards the right values than when we use lower the methods. So this is Numeca solver finite volume uh, method. Another example is this uh, hemisphere cylinder. Um, sorry, I forgot the, ah, the Reynolds is here. So this is again a runs computation. And again, when we compare, this is a, uh, a workshop by NASA, uh, we can see also the, the nice convergence of our method when we get to high polynomial orders with fewer degrees of freedom, always using fewer degrees of freedom than uh, finite volume methods. Um, okay, I'm not gonna give a talk at all about how we converge to steady state for runs, but that's a whole other lecture. I just mentioned that we have quite efficient methods to converge this to steady state, right? So we basically combine fast multigrid with semi implicit smoothers, and we are getting uh, quite convergence uh, in, in quite uh, reasonable times. Uh, okay. The other way to, to deal with turbulence is use implicit uh, LES, larger dissimulation. So, uh, to do LES, you can do implicit LES, you can do explicit LES. So I'll, I'll just show a little bit on the implicit LES side. So to do implicit LES, what you want is the numerical errors to act uh, as a subgrid model for the larger dissimulation, right? To have an implicit method that works well, you need, we think, to characterize the numerical errors. And we typically do that uh, through the Poneumann type analysis where we know we can see at which wave numbers the, the errors start acting. Second, uh, the errors should have a predominantly dissipative character. 
and hence can diffuse the non-resolved features in the subgrid and they should act at the correct wave number. So typically at quite medium to high wave numbers. Yeah. So for example, this would be, I have here a, a typical Kolmogorov cascade uh, energy against wave number. And what we see is that a good numerical behavior for ill, uh, for implicit LES would be something like this. It follows well everything when, when it's well captured and then suddenly drops at, at the cutting uh, wavelengths. And a bad behavior for implicit LES would be something that it's adding dissipation everywhere and maybe not enough, not enough. And there's some accumulation of energy at the wavelengths of the cutoff. Right, so there's different ways of adding uh, dissipation in numerical schemes. You can look at the Riemann solvers, in particular in DG, you have Riemann solvers, you can add some dissipation there. You can add, this, you can add dissipation in the viscous terms or even at artificial dissipation that would be almost explicit and yes. Uh, so we've tried different things. I will show you just uh, some, some solutions where we have compared compressible solvers, incompressible solvers with different uh, implicit um, mechanisms to, to add to grid. And we get reasonable results for uh, CL leaf and drug coefficients. If you have the polar leaf against drug for uh, I think that's the NACA zero zero trans for different angles of attack. What we're doing now in collaboration with Oriol Lemhut from BSC is we are going, so the, the, the big picture, the CL and the drag are okay, the lift and drag are okay, but now we're looking at the, at the small, uh, we're zooming, zooming in and trying to see what are the differences in fact of using implicit and explicit methods. We have everything in our solver, so we are running some fine computations and see how the boundary layer changes where, where the separation occurs and all these kind of things for different, different uh, flows. Right, regarding our acoustics, I've shown you this picture before. So this was the, the convergence the, of the sun pressure levels for some particular uh, measuring point here. Um, and what we have done also is uh, check the effect of tripping. Uh, so this is triggering the boundary layer to become turbulent. Uh, at, at some particular point. For this, we have used this paper of uh, Philip Slatter, and we have uh, implemented it for, for our airfoils. And what we observe is that there's a huge change in the directivity of the uh, acoustics when we uh, uh, measure it in these particular locations, right? So what we see is that uh, without triggering, we get typical uh, cardioid shapes for the directivity, whilst for uh, triggering, uh, trigger transition, we get a much more rounded uh, thing. So, so this is ongoing work. Uh, and this all has to do with how you set up the, the parameters, the amplitudes of these perturbations that are going to trigger the transition. Uh, by the way, here we are also comparing Paul William Hawkins with the array computations, and there are some small differences that we're trying to explain as well. Um, just one slide on ongoing work as well on shocks. So we are also working on capturing shocks in our solver. We have different methods of doing so, but this, this could be another complete, complete talk. Right, I'm, I'm coming towards the second part, the, the last part, uh, where I'm gonna show you some new avenues, we think, uh, in how we can accelerate CFD, right? And this involves some machine learning, adaption, uh, things like that. Right, so one of the ideas that we're very excited about is to use machine learning to accelerate CFD. So we're not trying to uh, get rid of the CFD at all, but we use machine learning to uh, go hand by hand with the CFD. So the main idea is if we have a high order method, so this is a high order polynomial, we need a very small time step because, uh, yeah, because of CFL restrictions. Whilst in, if we use a low polynomial order, uh, a coarse mesh resolution, we can use much larger time steps. And so the idea is, could we perhaps try to increase, so can we run a low order uh, method with the accuracy of a higher order method? That, that's perhaps the question. And the answer is, I think we have managed to do it. What we do is we, we will run a low order method. So this is this curve and we can correct at some point, uh, adding some source term to correct the lower the method to retrieve the accuracy of higher the methods. If we have this tool at hand, what we can do is increase the time step 
uh, to the low order limits uh, and bypass the high order CFL restrictions. That's the main idea. So how do we do that? Uh, of course, to simplify the explanation, but the idea is we have a low order evolution. This is just explicit uh, Euler for simplification. Q will be our Navistox operator. Um, and this will be advancing the low order solution. So this, we will not gain anything. The higher the solution, uh, we can think of the filter higher order solution. And this will uh, follow the same, the same time advancing, advancing technique. Now, what we propose is to use a low order. So this is exactly the same as the first one, the low order uh, time evolution, but corrected such that this correction term will uh, make this guy become like the high order filter solution, right? So we need to find this S that corrects us the low order solution to retrieve the high order accuracy. How can we do that? Well, the answer is machine learning. Uh, these days, most of the answers are machine learning and we don't know how to do things. So what we do is we know S is a function of, uh, of, the, of the solution in previous times. And we can train a, ne a neural network to with u as an input and such that we get the s's, the, the functions as an output. If we do so, we can correct the lower the solution, we retrieve the higher the solution. So we have tried that for uh, 1D burgers uh, equations. So there's, this is a we have a paper on, on 1D where we explain all the all the techniques, all the, all the ideas. And now we're working on the 3D, of course. So in 1D, what we observe is that if we go from P5 to P0, so this is the higher solution to the lower solution, we correct the lower the solution, we can advance the lower the solution uh, by a factor of 100 in terms of time step, which gives us speed ups of almost 60, right? And then when we compare and we reconstruct the, the solution after advancing it, we see that the high order uh, and the low order are exactly the same. Uh, of course, we have done that also for more complex flows. This is the work in progress, but uh, we have some solutions for rain for Taylor Green. So this is a turbulent flow at Reynolds 1600. Um, and what we see for those who don't, don't know the Taylor Green, this is an evolution of some vertical structures, and then you get turbulence, and then you get, you get isotropic decaying turbulence. This is with time. So what we do here is we're gonna use polynomial of the eight and polynomial of the three. That gives us a speed of factor quite conservative, I would say, of three. We could, we could even increase that, um, right? And what we observe is that we can go 12 times faster than the that if we were using the higher the method with almost the same accuracy. So here you have the error on the on this axis. You have time here, so we will start training at, at seven. We will train for a while. We will train for this part, and then we don't train anymore. And we use the forcing that we have trained in this previous time. And what we see is that the error when we have the forcing, this is with forcing, this is without the forcing, and this is the, the change between low order. So the error between when we compare low order against high order solutions, right? So this is the error is quite big because we have quite difference between low order and high order solution when we at the forcing, this S forcing that corrects, we get a much more accurate solution for a very long time, right? All this is time that we are gaining in our uh, lower the solution, having a, a quite accurate solution. Uh, of course, eventually the errors, uh, so the neural network that we, we train is not working anymore. So up to this point, here we have to train again for a while and leave it and train and leave it, etc. But we observe quite interesting saving uh, times. But together with Ricardo, we also, and, and Stefano uh, from KTH, we are also working on combining pins with the ideas that I just mentioned. So this is work in progress. Hopefully, soon we'll have some results. But in the past, we have worked with mesh adaption. So mesh adaption is uh, refining the polynomial order in particular areas of the domain. Uh, in, we have quite a few papers on uh, truncation error estimates. I'll just explain the idea because it's very easy. So if this is our Navistock's equation, uh, in, I'll, I'll show you for steady state only, right? See, in the steady state case, this term is zero, right? And the truncation error can be defined as, uh, as this. 
right, the John list. So this is the, the Navistox operator with some particular discretization evaluated at the exact velocity, right? Exact uh, solution. So we don't have the exact solution, but what we can do is estimate the exact solution with a much finer polynomial, with a much finer uh, resolution, right? So, and this will give us these truncation errors where we estimate the exact solution uh, at, at P and we have the R, the, the Navistox operator, evaluated at a coarser um, resolution N. Right, if we do that, what we have to do is we run one simulation, this in particular, and then this is the P, the P step. We solved for this, for P, and then with the solution we obtain for P, we only have to evaluate all these uh, operators with this solution. This is not solving the Navistox equation, just taking the solution and inputting in the in the coarser levels right so it's not not solving more problems um, so what we see is that truncation error shows exponential convergence similar to the errors that i showed you at the very beginning and hence because we know it's an exponential behavior we can throw a line we can uh, do an interpolation and extrapolate towards the values that we want for the error so we can extrapolate and see that we need in this particular element we do that element by element uh, we can see that here we need a polynomial of the 10 in this particular case to get the error that we want. Uh, we can do that in multiple directions. So we have that in isotropic, uh, anisotropic manner. So we have in X and Y directions, etc. And this allows us to save a lot of degrees of freedom. Uh, so we can see homogeneous refinement here against this, this uh, local peer refinement technique in different directions. Uh, just very quickly, no, I, I will jump that. Right, so I'm coming towards the last uh, application. So this, what I was talking about, it was typical mesh adaption, the classic mesh adaption technique. So now we are proposing a, a different idea, also uh, linked to machine learning. Our idea now is to, to use machine learning to detect flow regions. So if you think of the typical um, uh, uh, sensors to, to, to see regions in the flow domain, for example, the eddy viscosity sensor, you need to select a threshold, right? So you, you are to plot the vorticity level, you need the, the levels of vorticity, no? so you need to give a value and that will give you isocontrols of this particular value. So this is, happens with all, almost all the sensors. So the eddy viscosity, for example, will allow you to detect these regions of high eddy viscosity in the wake of this uh, circular cylinder at Reynolds 3900. But if you change the values of the, of the threshold, the, um, the structures that you get, so the regions that you get, uh, change quite a bit. Right, so uh, it's very sensitive. All the thresholds that we know, they're very sensitive to the values selected. And some often they cannot detect mixed regions. For example, here we have a laminar, uh, a laminar region within this turbulent region, this, this blue thing here, and it's not, incorporated in the eddy viscosity because that's only for the turbulent part. Uh -huh. What we were proposing is to use some clustering technique based on Gaussian mystery models. And these can automatically detect without any need for any threshold, uh, particular regions. So the regions that we're gonna detect are gonna depend on the feature space on the variables that we throw into our clustering model. So we have uh, we think a robust feature space model for a variety of Reynolds numbers, where we include uh, viscous dissipation, vorticity, et cetera, as variables. And we are able to detect all these regions uh, in the wake of the cylinder and the boundary layer. So we capture the boundary layer and the wake, including these laminar regions and these uh, turbulent regions. Uh, to check that we're doing things right, what we can do is we can compare uh, two of these variables that we have, so this is dissipation and, and rotation, uh, for the values we have inside the red region, inside the boundary layer and wake. And we see that we get values that are between zero and one, where we have non-dimensionalized that by the maximum value in the whole domain. So we're getting most of the, of all the values that have dissipation and rotation are in the region that we have uh, obtained. If we do the same for the outer flow, we see that the values are uh, almost negligible, meaning that uh, there's almost no value, no points in this uh, outer flow that have uh, uh, 
you know, a, a big value of rotation and, and dissipation. Uh, in addition, this clustering tells us something about the features that are included in the flow. So we can see vortex, vortex sheet structure, vortex tube structures, depending on the, how these correlations behave. So why do we want to use that? So we're thinking of using this for P adaption, where uh, we will include the polynomial order, we will increase the polynomial order in the regions that have high turbulence and high viscosity, so both laminar, uh, boundary layer, wakes, et cetera, and, make, and use a low polynomial outside. Um, so this is soon to come. Uh, I will finish with this uh, and some very brief conclusions. I think we have a, a, a solver that, again, is available on request and shows exponential decrease of the error, but linear increase in cost only. We have quite a few multi-physics included, and we are working on, on combining some new ideas with mesh adaption, but also machine learning, uh, etc. So with this, I'll finish. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Esteban. Very nice presentation. Uh, any questions? <laughs> Um, I'd like to ask you, Esteban, I think it was nice, the, um, the part that you showed where you have the force in uh, with machine learning and how it, uh, well, you have uh, very good results for a while, that it increases with time. Uh, what type of architecture are you using for that, uh, for that uh, section? Right, so it's, it's a typical neural network. The only slightly... Um, the only thing... I mean, of course, uh, I think with machine learning, you have to try, right? So we have tried many, many architectures. So it's a, a, a classic neural network with many layers. It's a deep uh, neural network. What we have tried to do is increase uh, the number of, uh, the, the width of the, of the layers, eventually to try to, if this helped. And it did help a little bit to increase the, the complexity. SN, so this term, which is a force, is a force um, um, for its point in space, right? That's so, uh, yes, that's correct. Because the architecture that you're using, which is um, a fully connected network, uh, an MLP, maybe using some more um, advanced um, like versions, you know, that like uh, that you can exploit convolution, so you can do you can exploit the spatial information in the data. Maybe that could um, that could give better results. Uh, and the other thing that could be interesting would be, I mean, of course, it's natural that the error is increasing with time, but there might be ways to embed temporal predictions as well, because here, of course, you don't really exploit the temporal correlations or the spatial correlations in the data, but maybe with certain architectures like combining uh, recurrency in time and then spatial, then maybe one can get better results. In fact, we have done that uh, in, a, in a brute force way. So, ah, so yeah. we have included the dependency of the current time and previous time step. Am, am I sharing this? Uh, you're using the my screen, right? So yeah, we can see your screen. Okay. Yeah. okay. So we, we have tried to include the, the information of the current time and previous times, up to five previous times, for example, uh, which is giving you a, a sense of the history of, of the evolution, right? So it's kind of a recurring neural network, more or less, le mm -hmm. le less expensive probably. Um, and we do see a little bit of the advantage in doing that. And sorry, when you include the previous pre time steps, do you do it in the input of the MLP? Yeah, yeah. Because uh, then the network can learn a bit of the history, but the network doesn't really know exactly how the steps are ordered in time. That's know? correct, that's correct. So with a recurrent, you would know that, but something that could be interesting and we could discuss if you want, um, it would be to use transformers for this, because we have been using transformers for inflow generators in true and boundary layers, and they work even better than recurrent networks. They're very good at temporal predictions in turbulence. And um, for the spatial stuff, we could think of um, starting with a CNN maybe, but even you know, arms or something like that, so that you can more effectively uh, use the spatial information that you have in your, in your field. Yeah, that, 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 that's right. I mean, the convolutional neural network was mainly because of an implementation issue. So the, the way yeah. we were doing it wasn't easy to couple with convolutional, but uh, of course that, that, that was the- But the to be honest, to even with this architecture, which is reasonably simple, it's quite impressive, the improvement that you get. I mean, it's, it's quite uh, quite nice. We think so too. I mean, there's, there's a few things we haven't mentioned, right? So um, 
got devilish is in the detail. No? In, in here, we have tried different Reynolds number for the Taylor Green, and you get different um, advantages depending on, on, on how smooth is your solution. So what we are developing in the new paper, it's uh, an estimation of the smoothness of the solution such that we know how much we can do in, the, in these jumps, right? If we need an LES model or not, we can do a DNS that depends on the resolution or in the course level and also in the in the in the fine level, in the course and the fine level, right? And that all all the, the smoothness of the solution is what tells you also how much you can gain in, in this in, in mm -hmm. these things. I'm also thinking that for different Reynolds numbers, one can actually, um, I mean, of course, you have transfer learning, but there are other ways in which you could have a network that is uh, able to, to extend to different Reynolds numbers that have not been seen during the training, which could also be quite um, quite promising. But yeah. I think this is very a very nice direction. This is very cool. Yeah. Yeah, we're quite excited about this. So. Yeah. But there's lots of things to try, as, as you mentioned. Oh, very, very nice. Thank you. More questions. If not, then uh, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you very much, Esteban. Thank you very much. Esteban is going to be here today, the whole day. Um, so if uh, you're interested in discussing, I mean, just uh, come by his office. I also copied him in the email um, of the um, thematic area. So you have his email information if you want to directly contact him. Um, yeah, and anyway, uh, we, I mean, he's available and I can also help you arrange a meeting if you want. Um, other than that, um, thank you very much and uh, have everybody a good day. Thank you very much. Bye bye. 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 Thank you.